Welcome back. How does Islam deal with female scholarship, specifically here in the West? We had the opportunity to sit down with Maryam Amir to learn about her journey on becoming a scholar at the Being Me Women's Conference. Maryam received her master's in education from UCLA. She's currently pursuing a second bachelor's degree in Islamic studies through Al-Azhar University. She studied the Arabic language and the Quran in Cairo, Egypt, and has also memorized the Quran. She's currently a lecturer with Hikmah Institute. Here is our interview with her now at the Being Me Women's Conference. Welcome to our show, Mariam. Thank you so much for shedding light on all these issues. So I want to uh, now talk about your personal story. So how did you uh, come to learning about Islam and how did Islam become so much into your life that you actually studied it? So my parents basically embraced Islam when they were in college in the United States. And when I was growing up, they really you know, wanted us to be close to God and Islam. And uh, they were very, very open and they didn't push us in any way. But I, I really wanted to be Britney Spears. I felt like that was my <laughs> okay. calling. Really? Seriously? I'm not kidding. No, absolutely. <laughs> you know, born and raised in California, it was a really big deal. Hollywood is nearby. Um, and so I wasn't into the whole Islam thing. And I remember my parents when I was in high school said that we're going to take a trip to Mecca and we're going to go, uh, you know, to this, this holy pilgrimage. And my reaction... Sorry, I need to ask. Before that, yeah. did they try to instill Islam? Like, you need, you should wear a hijab. Like, did they try they, to instill They definitely encouraged our praying and they encouraged all of the, you know, fasting and going to the mosque. But they were never forceful. Okay. Um, hijab was something that I started on my own and it's a long story, but it wasn't because I was trying to be pious. That's a completely different story. <laughs> Okay. We can talk about it first time, <laughs> but they were never forceful of that. And actually, when I said I want to put it on, they were both like, "Are you sure?" Because it's a really big what commitment. Is she doing? Yeah. Um, so yeah, but when I actually, when 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 they told me that we're going on this pilgrimage, I was like. I don't want to change. I'd heard of people becoming pious when they go to Mecca, and then I was like, I don't want that for me. I'm popular. I'm into school. I have all the stuff going on. And like, Britney Spears is Yeah, no, no, we're not, I'm not going to be praying. <laughs> anyway, we go to Mecca, and I just remember just seeing the Kaaba for the first time, you know, seeing the house of God for the first time. It just hit my heart. It was the first time that I felt like God is real, and this is tangible, and I'm going to die one day, and I'm going to go back to Him, and I want to make my life count for something and so I started reading the Quran and I had never I mean I'm not Arab so I didn't know Arabic so I started reading it in the translation and the more that I read it the calls for social Sorry, how justice how old were you when you did um, all this, this I was in high school so okay. I was probably close to 15 okay and I know that sounds really young for a lot of people but really you know it's incredible how much we dismiss what adolescents go through and the process of finding your identity in that period so in that period going through that process of reading the Quran in translation reading about social justice in the Quran, the calls for social justice, women's empowerment in the Quran, I just felt like I didn't, I felt like I could to start channeling all my energy that I wanted to use for like, you know, <laughs> I'm not dissing singers, yeah. may God bless them, you know, with the best. But instead of using it for entertainment purposes, I could use it to call people to social justice. I could use it to help create these transformations in society. Not to say that they don't do that too, yeah. but I could do it within a faith perspective. And I could do that for women in our community. There are women, regardless of your faith, our gender deals with so much. And yeah. the Quran is so empowering for women. And so I really found that that calling in the Quran. And then I decided, you know what, it's not enough for me to read it. I want to read it in, in English. I want to read it in Arabic. And I want to be able to call other people to understanding what the Quran really is about. Because, you know, in the mosque, sometimes when you go as a woman, I don't know about what it's like in Canada, but sometimes the message isn't necessarily you know, it's not necessarily welcoming. for me. Yeah. It's not Very welcoming. Similar, yeah. And that's not that's not the message of God. And that's not the message of the prophetic community, the Prophet Muhammad, God's peace be upon him. His community was so empowering for women, feisty women, women who were involved in battles because, you know, at that time there were a lot of battles for self-defense. There were battles where people were fighting because of the injustice. Women used to be buried alive. And now women are partaking in the political system. It was incredible to me that we didn't have these messages in our mosques when our faith is so in, uh, so intimate when it comes to raising our voices, not having other people speak for us, but amplifying the voices that we have. And that is such an example in the prophetic narrative. So for myself, I wanted to help share that. And that's why I ended up going to Egypt so that I could study and start so to So walk me through your journey because I read an article about this very experience and uh, I was shocked about the experience that you 
uh, had studying Islam in the United States right. and the perspective that you were uh, given about how you should be as a Muslim scholar, female scholar, versus what happened in Egypt. So right. walk me through that. So growing up, I didn't see Muslim women giving lectures, even though there are so many qualified Muslim women. It just wasn't a norm for our community, unfortunately, because that's not an Islamic you know, it's not necessarily an Islamic practice. Um, so I didn't see, I didn't have female role models. And the way that I saw the mosque, you know, uh, sometimes our events are very segregated. And yeah. what you practice of Islam is kind of like unique to when you walk into a Muslim event. And that's not what you, you know, you're in, you know, so I'm in school, I'm working, I'm working in different sp spaces. And then I go to the mosque and it's a whole new era, right? Yeah. So <laughs> when I went to, to Egypt, I realized that this is an entire country and there are Coptic Christians in Egypt, there are Jews in Egypt, there are people of other faiths, but overall it's a Muslim majority country and women were involved in every field of life and they were not just kind of like, okay, we don't have speakers who are women at this event. It was like women were just there, obviously, because it's a society. So, you know, in, in the United States we're a minority, what we see of Islam is kind of like what Muslims practice based on what they've you know, imported from whatever country they're coming from, or the indigenous population, perhaps whatever customs were a part of that population. And so we don't see necessarily, you know, a one way of practicing as a community, but going into Egypt and seeing that, you know, Islam is, Islam is just living life and then just living life. It was really altering for me as a young person who hadn't seen that as a greater society. You know, I didn't see that in the streets because So I how couldn't. was it in the mosque when you say they were living Islam and it was a way of life? Explain that to me because we're always taught Islam is a way of life. What does it actually look like when you went to Egypt and how it spoke to you? Well, I don't want to I don't want to make this I know we've just made this dichotomy of okay, Islam in Egypt looks different from Islam in America. That's not necessarily what I mean. Just my personal experience yeah. was you know, I went into, I'd go to the grocery store. Okay, almost everyone is Muslim, right? So like you have Muslim women who are business owners. You have Muslim women who are teaching classes. You have Muslim women who are um, entrepreneurs. You have Muslim women who are um, driving and they are chauffeuring other women. You have women in every part of life. And, and I guess you're talking about as a society, as a they society. were being supported in yes, every aspect. Yes, absolutely. It was just part of the norm. Versus in the United States, it's just because we're not a majority, we're not a majority community. So I didn't see that. All I saw were, when I saw Muslim functions, it was like at a conference. And what do Muslims at a conference look like? We're obviously, we're not going to be yeah. doing normal society <laughs> stuff because we're at a conference. So it's just the dichotomy of never seeing it before. Seeing it as a society, it was like, wow, this is incredible. It's just normal. It's not like I'm always the other versus in the United States, I'm always the other. And so are so many people of color. So the point is going back to the United States, my understanding of Muslim women's roles shifted because not only did I have this experience, but also I learned Arabic there. I studied with scholars and I was able to continue studying scholarship from a traditional perspective where I did have access to texts that talked about women's roles being so, um, so, so scholarly that Muslim women are, you know, over 9,000 Hadith scholars, so Hadith, the prophetic yeah. comment, the prophetic sayings and the actions of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Sometimes we feel like when we hear the word scholars, we're hearing men, but really, over 9,000 Hadith scholars who were women, you know, there's not a single Hadith scholar who was a woman who was considered somebody who wasn't um, a role model to take uh, knowledge from, and we do have men who weren't. So we have a rich history, Islamic history, of women in scholarship. We have a rich history of women being judges, of women being a part of the political system, being surgeons, being therapists, being mothers. There are women who are a part of every single aspect of life in our history. I didn't see that necessarily in the United States because, I mean, we're a growing community as the immigrant community. Of course, the African-American Muslim community has done so much for, yeah. for all Muslims. And obviously, they have built our nation because so many Muslims, so many of the free people who were enslaved from Africa were Muslim. So, so, you know, African-American Muslims have built the United States on their backs. But the point is that we have this kind of, we're a minority, we're all over the place. I feel like I've said the same thing so many times. But the point is looking at Egypt and seeing what that looks like in terms of Islamic history, that was really empowering for me and it helped me start speaking to that narrative, which is what I originally felt like I found in the Quran. As we wrap up, what is one piece of advice that you can give to both the American and the Canadian community about um, 
creating spaces within Muslim communities where women are um, just as uh, active and agents of change as the men are? I would say when we look at classical Islamic knowledge, traditional Islamic knowledge, we see women as teachers of the Quran, as Quran reciters, as people who would begin nonprofits. Fatima al Fahri started the first university in the world that gave out degrees. We see women who were pillars of every part of society. What we need to do as a Muslim community is start giving platforms to women in our communities. One, creating spaces where we can study the way that men can, and alhamdulillah, God, God, thank God, we've already started that process, but also amplifying those voices, bringing those voices onto stages, creating programming specific where women's voices are encouraged, because other women need to see that this is a normal part of our faith. This isn't abnormal. And it's so hard when you hear people say Muslim women are oppressed. I mean, in some places, Muslim women are oppressed, just like non-Muslim women are oppressed. Yeah. But the point is that that's not from our faith. So bringing us back to recognizing that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, created a society where women were involved in every aspect. How can we do that tangibly in our community? And if you're not a Muslim but would like to be an ally, how can your voice support uh, the Muslim community through social media, through sharing stories of Muslims with your friends and family, through coming to mosques and helping create spaces where people feel comfortable being Canadian, being American, being a Muslim American, a Canadian Muslim, and recognizing that there is no, uh, you know, there's no opposition in those identities. And really it's something that um, th this, this, this unity is something that the Quran calls for when it says that we've created you in nations and tribes so that you may get to know one another. I love how we're discussing such complicated topics and you can always nicely wrap it up with some simple, tangible things that we can do. So thank you I so much. I appreciate you Maria. shedding light on all of these topics. Thank you for, for bringing it to light. Thank you. Hey YouTube, we hope you benefited from this video. If you liked it, or if you didn't, let us know in the comments below. And if you're interested in learning more, check out some of our other videos. And don't forget to subscribe so you can get new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday.